Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. I'm Alexandra McKnight. I'm the Chargé d'Affaires at U.S. Embassy in Dublin. Thank you for joining us for what will be a fascinating discussion with LGBTQ plus activist Carla J. And we're fortunate to also be joined by journalist, broadcaster, and author Una Malali as moderator for this session. In his proclamation for Pride Month, President Biden calls for Americans to stand in solidarity with LGBTQ plus Americans in their ongoing struggle against discrimination and injustice. President Biden's call for allyship is underscored by his commitment for a diverse workforce. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg is the first openly LGBTQ plus person to serve in the cabinet. And Assistant Health Secretary Dr. Rachel Levine is the first openly transgender person to be confirmed by the US Senate. Of the 1,500 federal agency employees that his administration has appointed thus far, nearly 14% identify as LGBTQ+. This would have been inconceivable in 1969. For many of us, it will be hard to imagine what life was like for Carla as a young person in New York in 1969, the year that the Stonewall Uprising took place. And as we celebrate Pride Month, we should also acknowledge that challenges remain in the United States, in Ireland, and around the world. And that's why it's so imperative that we hear voices like Carla's, so that we can understand how far our societies have come in the struggle for the human rights of LGBTQ plus people. And so we can continue to work together, charting a path forward. Thank you, Carla J, for sharing your story with us today, and Una Malali for moderating the session. Happy Pride to Carla, Una, and everyone watching today. And I'm tremendously excited to speak to a legend of LGBTQ rights. Um, the LGBT rights movement is living history, of course, and we have so much to learn and to um, continue from those who were witness to seismic moments and fought battles at a time when there was nowhere near the kind of mainstream support that there is in many countries today. Of course, the LGBTQ plus rights movement, like all movements for equality in many ways, operates uh, on a strange version of time where in certain jurisdictions, things are far ahead and almost futuristic compared to places where queer people are killed, imprisoned, attacked and demonized today, which does remind us that pride is vital and pride is protest. And indeed, where homophobia, transphobia and biphobia persist in jurisdictions where there are uh, a suite of rights available to LGBTQ plus people. Carla J has been at the forefront of our movement and over the next half an hour or so, we're going to talk about her reflections and learnings. And also, if you want to ask a question or have um, a, a comment, um, please just put it in the comments uh, underneath these, this video um, and, and take the opportunity to ask a question if you have anything to ask and um, I'll field it uh, to Carla here. So Carla, welcome. How's it going? Uh, where oh. are you actually in the world? I'm in New York City. Happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride to you too. Listen, take me back to that time um in in the after or around the time of stonewall like what was the context like up close in terms of the scene itself and that flashpoint paint us a picture of, of what it was like it's interesting because uh the in new york city the um clubs and bars were run by organized crime because we as uh queer people were illegal. And there had been, as you know, prohibition in the United States. And once prohibition ended, there were a lot of restrictions on drinking. And bars had an obligation not to be disorderly or to serve disorderly people. And since we LGBTQ people were illegal, our love for each other was illegal. It was illegal to dance with each other. It was illegal to wear clothing not related to your birth, you know, so a, a woman couldn't wear something that could be identified as men's clothing and vice versa. All of these things were against the law. So it was illegal to service a drink. And therefore, only organized crime was willing to have the bars in New York City because they could make a really good profit on it. And they could also sell 
alcohol on which they hadn't paid taxes. You know, they, they, they got this illegal alcohol and they sold that as well. So for them, it was extremely profitable, but it wasn't always so nice for us. Mm. Did you frequent the lesbian bar Cookies at all? Yes, that was the only lesbian bar. And Cookie was a, a, a she was a mafia, you know, front. We don't know whether she really owned the bar. And um, she was someone who had sort of sprayed her hair into a beehive maybe in the 1950s. And here was 1960 and her hair was still in place. Uh, the worst aspect of the bar, aside from the high prices, was that because we were perverts under the law, she had a guardian outside the, the toilet, which you might call the loo or the jacks or something like that in other countries. And when you went, there was this person outside who would hand you two sheets of toilet paper as you went in. <laughs> and it was so humiliating uh, how this person knew what you were supposed to need and that you weren't allowed in there with another person because you might have sex in the bathroom, although this was something I had never seen among women. Uh, so, you know, the bars were really not very nice. Uh, men stood around the edges of the dance floor in the women's bar and, and, and they, they rubbed their crotches. It, it was just really kind of repulsive. But we went there because we had no other place to go. I mean, people have to remember that in 1969, there were no coffee shops, there were no centers for us, there were no, you know, the student groups were just beginning at two universities in the United States. We had no social life except for the bars. So we were happy to go to the bars to have music to dance to, to be able to dance with someone like us. In this atmosphere, um, as you describe it, then the the events around um, what is now kind of called the, the Stonewall uprising were obviously occurring in a very potent um, atmosphere with particular attention, I suppose, to the harassment, I guess, um, from from police. Um, do you recall like the 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 moments in the in the lead up to that? Like, was there a particular kind of heightened energy even in the conversations people were having? Was there a breaking point? I think that this was a historical event that actually had happened at other bars around the country. Mm. As early as the 1930s in Buffalo, New York, lesbians in bars were rebelling against police raids. And in the mid 1960s in California, uh, the trans people stood up and fought back against the police at the Compton cafeteria, which was near San Francisco. So there were these rebellions. What, you know, and the police would come in and raid bars, even though organized crime paid them off. Because around elections, it was very tempting to clean up vice. And they would generally let most people go. But if you were trans, if you were not dressed in your three pieces of, of gender correct clothing, they would arrest you. So um, what really made the Stonewall uprising different is not that the police came in, not that, the, the, that people resisted even, but the media attention that got, and the people were so angry that they fought back for a week and, and that something came out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Stonewall was really the spark, but an organization called the Gay Liberation Front formed within two weeks of the uprising. And we were determined that things like this had to stop. And we really changed the world. We didn't think we would, but we started really to change the world. We did not, by the way, stop bar raids, even in New York City. I mean, there are a lot of myths around Stonewall. And I think that's one of them that we stood up and, and we fought back and that was that, but it wasn't that. And there were terrible bar raids after that as well. Yeah, the told history can be often like focus on one particular place or make it very neat in terms of the narrative around it. As you say, 
um, it, it is more complex complex than that. But you mentioned there the, the Gay Liberation Front. Um, I believe you were the first female chair of, of the Gay Liberation Front. What were those early meetings like? Well, they were they were kind of um, they were chaotic and they were wonderful. Um, there had been, you know, gay and lesbian organizations prior to Stonewall. They were very white and middle class, but the Gay Liberation Front had all kinds of people, people of every race and social class and gender identity. Um, so there, were, there was truly this LGBT uh, Q spectrum and, and, and people were into everything. There were people who were into having sex in the back of trucks under the highway. And there were people who were into SM and who were out about this. And there were people I never would have met, you know, in the course of my feminist and anti-war activities. So we got together and the meetings were rather chaotic because after all, what is it that we had in common? We, we had in common that straight society hated us and they wanted to get rid of us, but didn't mean that we really were coming from the same place. However, we did try to reach consensus and this was a long drawn out process. And eventually we broke up into what were called cells and these cells carried out activities. They carried out social protests, they organized dances and these smaller subgroups were able to create a lot of activities that a larger group may not have identified with and been able to agree upon. Mm -hmm. It's interesting like how so much of that um, intuitively or otherwise is kind of rooted in, you know, that idea of, of, of diverse coalition, which always seems to be a much more effective method of organizing than laying down particular rules or something like that. Um, I'm reading Sarah Shulman's uh, book on the history of ACT UP at the moment and, and that idea of, you know, people were at where, are always at where they're at. So if somebody wants to do one action and another person doesn't, that's OK, but don't stand in the way. Was that kind of a, that philosophy, um, you know, a precursor to ACT UP, really, if people were diverse in what they wanted, that organizing a dance was as political as organizing a protest? Yes, one of the things that uh, we in the GLF had learned from the Yippies, um, there, and there was recently this, this really interesting movie, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, which I think brought some of their activities back to life, was that it really doesn't take a lot of people to make social change. That if you are willing to take the risk of a social protest, that you really don't need thousands and thousands of people to get out there and have a demonstration. You need a small committed group of individuals uh, to go and take the risk of organizing an activity and to do it. For example, the most famous lesbian activity, which was the Lavender Menace takeover of the Second Congress to Unite Women, had a total of maybe 40 women who went into the Congress pulled the light switch off. And when the lights came on, the Congress of Women was completely surrounded by lesbians in the aisle, holding signs like, take a lesbian to lunch. We are your worst nightmare and your best fantasy. And, you know, they were so shocked, they didn't know what to do with us. The other advantage back then, and also for, not by the time ACT UP was doing things, but television was live. So if you went into a TV studio, you could seize a television show, which had a three second delay, but which was not on tape. And therefore you could make a bigger impact on television audiences by just going in there and, um, and daring them to arrest you. I mean, it's really interesting in all the years I did these uh, kind of zaps as we called them, Luckily, I was not arrested. I, you know, it's hard to believe in ret retrospect that someone maybe was watching over me. But, you know, we took over TV shows and uh, I was part of the takeover of the Ladies Home Journal. We, we went in front of Time Magazine and the New York Times and the Village Voice to demand they use the word gay, which was considered a dirty word. 
<laughs> newspapers would not print the word gay. It was just considered uh, a, a really filthy word and they would not put it in print. I mean, it's so crazy to imagine what things were like then. We couldn't even get um, our activities advertised because no one would print the word gay. As a little sub story, just to tell people how we did these things, is we would go in New York City to Chinatown because the printers in Chinatown who primarily printed menus could not read English. And we would print things up and say, here, print 300 copies of this. And they'd say, yes, yes, they'd give us a price. They had no idea what they were printing. And that's how we got things printed. I mean, it's a wonderful little uh, footnote to history that we depended on the kindness of people who spoke no English. Yeah, very inventive way to go about things as, as well. I'm interested in what you're saying there about um, the, the the Women's Congress because, you know, this tension um, in, in the in the earlier women's movements with regards to, you know, letting lesbians participate or whatever, um, people kind of forget that that was quite pronounced, really. Like, what was your experience with that? Were you finding allies within the women's movement or the feminist movement or did you realize that you had to very much um, bolster the LGBTQ movement to, to, to make progress there as a lesbian? Before the uh, Stonewall uprising, I was involved in red stockings and I was involved afterwards as well. It was a radical Marxist feminist group that developed a class analysis of feminism and developed what we call consciousness raising. And that was a product of, of red stockings, as well as the phrase sisterhood is powerful. So it was a very important second wave radical feminist group. But because they were Marxists, they wanted to see a class analysis of feminism. And they wanted to see all men as oppressors and all women as oppressed. And they were unwilling to see the way in which they might be oppressing us as lesbians. It was very inconvenient for class analysis. Betty Friedan, who is more mainstream with now, thought that lesbians would mar the reputation of the women's movement and that the um, mainstream would look at the women's liberation movement and say that, that, we, that the women's liberation movement was a bunch of dykes, but it was a bunch of lesbians. And she tried to stop that by firing uh, lesbians who work for now and by expelling anyone she thought was a lesbian. She threw out some women who were not, she just thought they were. And she was a terrible homophobe. I have to say in all fairness, there were many women within the movement who were not homophobic, but um, there was this idea that they were not going to get out there and fight for lesbian rights. They also were not interested circa 1970 in, in having workshops on class or in race. So the issues were primarily for white middle-class women. When we took over the Congress to Unite Women, we demanded that not only should they put lesbianism on the agenda, but they also had to add issues of class and race. And they did. And those issues never came off the agenda. Mm. When did you find the, or feel or was it identifiable to you that the dial moving a little bit? Like, obviously, you know, in a context where publications wouldn't even print the word gay, you're so up against it. But was there any moment in particular where you thought, oh, we're actually making progress here. We're making a difference. By the mid 1970s, I think one of the biggest developments was that, that we LGBT people had developed our own um, culture. And it, it sometimes was a very political culture. For example, out of one of the takeovers, which was at NYU, where we, that's New York University, where we went into a sub-basement to demand that we have a dance. And we sat in there for four days and four nights. And Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson were down there. And on the way there, we had passed some homeless street 
trans people. And I said to them, come on, join us. Come on and sit in the basement. It'll be cool in there. It was September, it was still hot. Come on, join us. So they did. And when we were in that sub-basement, Sylvia saw that those youth were so much worse off than she was that when she came out, she and Marsha formed a group called STAR, Street Transvestites Action Revolutionaries, and they opened a, a storefront for these people to go and stay until they could find housing. Now, that kind of thing that we formed ourselves, music festivals, publishing companies, concerts, um, centers, which some of which made it, some of which failed, all kinds of political and cultural activities, these things were uh, firm, uh, firmly established by the mid 1970s. And we knew that even if they came after us, they couldn't take the songs out of our heads, they couldn't burn down every book that had come out, that we were really at a place now that we had never been before. Mm. It's interesting to see how, like, how strong a role culture plays in in that activism yet it's frequently kind of brushed aside as not as Im, Im, quote unquote important as the purely political or the purely activist stances what kind of tensions were going on early on in in, in the gay liberation front in particular did people have different points of view in terms of whether they were opposing certain actions and so on Yes, most of, you know, what's interesting is the Gay Liberation Front is what today would be called intersectional. And we were very involved with other groups like the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, which was a Puerto Rican action group, um, the Women's Liberation Movement, of course, and many other groups. But there were people within the Gay Liberation Front who felt that, oh no, you know, we should keep away from the Black Panthers, that people shouldn't side with Cuba. And some people actually went to Cuba to help with the sugar harvest. So there were a lot of tensions within the Gay Liberation Front movement and people really didn't agree on this intersectional approach. I find to, when the gay movement became professionalized, by the mid 70s, I think that was a real loss that we gave up our concerns and our interactions with other organizations. And I think, for example, in this country, that the terrible laws that many states are trying to pass um, to curb the way that trans youth can get medical attention, for example, that that has to do with the way that the LGBTQ movement has not come out really to support women's right to choose. Because if women can't control our bodies, how are trans people who are less powerful going to get to control their bodies? This is, this is a universal concept that you should have the right to say what you do with your body. And you have a private moment with your doctor and you get to choose this, and we need to link up. This was a struggle then, and I think it's a struggle now. I, I think that, that within every movement, there are always people who are willing to sh throw the most marginalized people under the bus and to think they'll get more of their own rights. It's, it, it's, it's kind of sad in that way. Yeah, and that's, so it's like, totally counterproductive as well you know that's not that's not how things work although I think in in Ireland one of the very interesting things in having two referendums on you know issues of equality quite close together one on marriage equality in 2015 and one on abortion in 2018 was how much um straight women and um, LGBT people kind of crossed over into into both things, like the amount of gay men who canvassed for um, abortion rights, for example, was really quite a lot, almost kind of paying tribute to the amount of straight women who kind of came out in support of marriage equality. Um, but that intersectionality like is so key today. 
Um, and you talk about like the, the professionalization of the movement. And I think that that's not necessarily something that people dig into because they want to see this linear trajectory where everything got better and then it, it was amazing. But can you describe that a little bit in terms of what was um, what was lost and and that kind of gentrification of activism, I suppose, um, which I think ACT UP really broke apart, actually. Well, we wanted not to change this law or that law. We wanted to change the world. And we said things like, we will never go straight until you go gay. We were out to really transform the culture. And I think in a way, you know, mainstream culture has been um, changed a lot by our influence. As Rita Mae Brown once said, if Michelangelo had been straight, the Sistine Chapel would have been done in white with a roller. You know, but we, so we've, we've been out there, you know, for centuries making an impact on the way the world is seen and described. But I think that we had a more radical view. What we wanted was for people really to have the right to live the way they wanted. Um, you know, I'm married, but I always thought that people should have the right encoded in law, if there were going to be laws, to live as they want, that you should be able to live in a collective, that you should be able to live singly and to have as much dignity and the same rights as a couple. I mean, in this country, the health insurance is always a struggle. Why should some people have to get married in order to have a great health policy? These are social inequities that we wanted overturned. And we didn't want to change laws because we wanted to focus on changing people's minds. We thought that that was more important. I think that in a way that heterosexual culture really wasn't ready for LG marriage. And that a lot of the backlash that we see is in response to that, that they really weren't as accepting of us as we may have initially thought. And now they're coming back, they're trying attacks at the margin. And once they succeed at those, or if they succeed at those, they'll head more and more towards a centrist attack. Mm. Is that something that you're worried about, given like the amount of, of, of your life and your efforts um, and your activities that you've put into this cultural shift, to this changing of, of, of a nation and indeed of the world, that we are seeing um, you know, the very similar forces, as you say, attack at the margins, the attack on trans youth, the attack on trans people's rights to be in particular spaces, and of course, the attacks on women's um, bodily autonomy. Like, are, are you worried about the, the current context in the US? You know, I'm very worried. I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how delighted I am, of course, that President Biden is an office and things could be far worse. But I think there, there are hundreds of laws being proposed as we sit here that will curb various rights. The right of expression in the classroom, where in, in some states such as Arizona, teachers can no longer say positive things about LGBTQ people. I mean, that's a real violation of the First Amendment. I don't have um, a lot of faith that the rights of individuals are going to be upheld in this country over the rights of religious organizations. And I think that the religious organizations are going to be a wedge in to take away various rights. And yes, I, I'm very concerned about it. I think that after marriage was legalized, I think there was a big, you know, inhalation and exhalation. And then people said, yeah, this is it. And once you say that, then you really are in danger because the tiger is always at the gate and you have to be aware and constantly fighting for your lives. If people come out once a year for pride, that's not going to do it. You have to be out there all the time fighting for something. We don't all have to belong to the same organization. 
the same group uh, or give the same amount of money. But if everybody did something every week, we would be around the world in much better condition. And we have to remember that in 70 countries around the world, same-sex acts are illegal and sometimes punishable by death. And we have to fight for those people as well. We can't leave some people behind here and think, well, everything's just fine because no one's out there trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that kind of monopolization of the LGBT rights movement by marriage, as you say, caused like a bit of a resting on the laurels thing in its aftermath in the US and in other in other countries. But how do we take the lessons from the diverse intersectional movements that were formed um, with you at the helm in, in, in one case um, um, into today's context? Um, and how do we successfully fight those nefarious forces who just repeat so much the same stuff that has gone before but in often a more insidious ways. I think that we have to be out there as individuals and as small as groups, small or large, fighting for our rights and also the rights of others. I think that, you know, Black Lives Matter, for example, we have to be out there and we have to fight and say, we're with you, we're with you on this cause. And people are going to come with us for our cause as well. We cannot be there as a one theme organization, just mm -hmm. fighting for our rights. Because I can show you the downside of this. After marriage equality came in, there was a big organization in New York State called Empire Pride. And they folded a month later. It was a huge organization that was fighting for LGBT rights in New York State. A month later, they went under. Now, some of the other organizations, they see the lesson of this. They, they you know, I don't know exactly um, the degree to which they, you know, if we had rights tomorrow, a lot of these organizations would go. We have to fight. We have to align ourselves with other people. We have to fight around health. I think that COVID has shown us all the inequities in the healthcare system. And it, we don't all have to do the same thing, but we have to look around us and care about other people. For me, the saddest part of the Trump years has been seeing other people and more people stating, you know, this is what I want to do. I don't want to wear a mask. I'm not wearing a mask. My dog, I don't want to put my dog on a leash. My dog's off the leash. That we don't seem to care as much in this country anymore about other individuals who don't share our worldview. So that's what we have to undo. Mm, yeah, and that's a, that's a major project um, to get going on, but it can be done in people's everyday lives, of course. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is what lessons do you think you learned um, and, and can share from people who maybe get like caught up in the more pedantic aspects of of activism who like so what you know the one thing that I sometimes get frustrated with is like an infighting attitude or people like really going after very small things that that don't necessarily matter in the bigger picture obviously this is also this is not just a quality of like online activism but it is quite dominant in online activism how do you think you kind of can can get people or allow people to kind of see the bigger picture and have perspective and not be sweating the small stuff or, or having that suck up energy that is needed for much bigger things? You raise such an excellent point here because I often say to people, you know, we don't need the patriarchy. We're doing a great job here of eating each other. You know, we're just we're just destroying each other. And I think that my biggest regret from the early movement, uh, from feminism and the gay liberation movement, is how pedantic we were in regard to each other. We were so judgmental of each other. 
Uh, people were critical of, of butch femme. You know, these were people who were imitating heterosexuals. We were critical of bisexuals. These people were just fence sitters. They just couldn't make up their mind that they were really queer and they just couldn't own up. Well, you know, we just drove people out of the movement. We were all guilty of thinking these cruel things about each other. And, and I have to say, I was not an exception to this, but it was so wrong. When, you know, when people have to fight, we're in this together. And we have to see the ways in which we have commonality, not the ways in which we are different. Um, we have to remember that back then the big thing was the straight people didn't see a difference <laughs> among us. And that's still true. The, the people who want us all to burn in hell, the people who want to hang us, no matter what their religion, no matter what their politics, they're not going to see that you look a little more acceptable than some person who doesn't dress the way they would like us to dress. We have to have a big tent or we're not going to have any tent at all. Yeah, and I guess like a, a lot of the time, you know, well said, but a lot of the time people are kind of, I think, asserting themselves out of insecurity or trying to be territorial. And I think if you create that larger space that everybody owns, that just begins to look ridiculous, right? Like <laughs> if we if we're all in it together, then, you know, carving out little um, carving out territory seems kind of a foolish exercise in a way. Yes. You know, there are, I understand there are, you know, arguments and people want their own spaces. And this is a really difficult question, but we really have to sit down and negotiate our differences. And I was first, my first alliance was with the peace movement. And I was a big believer in Gandhi. And one of the things that I learned is if you see people as enemies, they can never be your friends. So that this is a terrible starting position and people feel the way that they feel. And you have to find ways that maybe you can come together and not attack other people who are also oppressed. We're not going to agree, but what is it that we can work on together? Or at least can we work against the patriarchy and not attack each other? and agree not to do that. Because there are groups in the United States who actually have been working you know, with the right to create laws that oppress some people who are in the LGBT spectrum. And for me, I think that, you know, and for the people affected, it's, it's, more, it's more painful. I mean, I, I identify as non-binary, but generally when you're, you're an elder, people just see you as an elder. They don't see you anymore as having a sexual identity or as being, you know, uh, you know, are, are, are you a man? I do get, you know, sometimes I go in a restaurant and people say, do you belong in here? What are you doing in here? And I say, what are you doing in here? Well, we're doing the same thing in the bathroom. But the, the grace of being old is being less bothered by the people out there in terms of who you are. So we have to find ways to give each other the grace to live and to get after those people who don't want any of us to live. I mean, people have to think about whether they're willing to go for the larger good and try to work out the differences in some way. It's, I realize it's very complex and there are wrongs on both sides. People call names and it gets very entrenched. Well, I think that message of common ground um, and working together and coalition and solidarity is a great one to end this conversation. Carla, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to speak with you. Thank you so much um, to the US Embassy of Dublin for organizing this conversation. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much to everybody um, who's been watching this. Really appreciate it. And of course, happy Pride to you, Carla, in New York City and happy Pride to everybody watching. 
And thank you and thank, uh, thank the embassy. And I'm so pleased to be with you. I just wish I could be with you in person. <laughs> That's my only regret. Soon, <laughs> I, I soon. I love Ireland, yes. Thanks so much.